Good evening. It is such a joy to be here with you here in this beautiful Chicago History Museum and to be here sponsored by Haymarket Books. And Anthony, I want to thank you for your leadership on the page and in the world, and also Julie Fain. Um, let's thank them for their courage and uh, for giving voice to what otherwise remains hidden. I also want to pay my respects and gratitude to the Lannan Foundation. It's an extraordinary foundation committed to arts, social change, indigenous people, and they have a way of supporting not only individual visions, but the collective vision. And I really want to acknowledge Barbara Ventrello, who's here, and Laurie Betlad. Thank you. Tim and I are deeply honored to be here tonight in pursuit of cultural freedom. I can honestly think of nowhere I would rather be, and I mean this, and no place that is more appropriate for this conversation and celebration of these ideals and ideas of free speech than Chicago. I love this city, and I love your lake. It reminds me very much of where I come from in, in Salt Lake City and Great Salt Lake, and so it's wonderful to be here at the Third Coast. So. Or do you call it the Middle Coast? Each? Yeah, it's wonderful. I, I walked along the edge this morning and was completely inspired. Um, today I visited the Art Institute, one of the great institutions in our country, with a dear friend, Allison Hales, who I love so much that um, I asked her if I could be her adopted mother. But it's become where she really is a dear sister of mine. Today, I should tell you she's an MFA student um, at the Art Institute in Textiles, and we were talking about climate change and the group, Chicago Youth Climate Coalition, who is interested in the divestment program and campaign, even um, with MFA students such as uh, Allison. Um, and I honor you, and I just think this is, this is our future. And Allison, I really thank you for your leadership. So, uh, we went together to look at a beloved artist of ours, Georgia O'Keeffe, and I'm sure all of you have stood in that wonderful uh, stairwell and been inspired by those clouds that she painted in 1965 when she was 77 years old. I was here in June and um, actually was laying on my back looking up at those clouds and I was asked to please remain upright. <laughs> And I said, but couldn't this be an act of artistic civil disobedience, the fact that you have no bench there? Um, but what was interesting this time, um, being with Tim in these last few days, uh, coming back from the Arctic where climate change is, is very apparent in terms of the temperatures, I no longer saw O'Keeffe's painting as clouds, but I saw them as melting pieces of ice. And I thought, our perception is shifting. And as our perception shifts, everything we see takes on a different kind of resonance. Tim De Christopher has been one of those shifting presences for me. We know his story. On December 19th, 2008, Tim De Christopher, a 28-year-old economics student at the University of Utah, had just finished his last exam for the semester. The Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance was sponsoring a protest over the BLM auction to sell off oil and gas leases within America's Red Rock Wilderness. And I know there are many wilderness supporters here in this audience and in this city. Tim rode the bus down to the BLM offices. The protest was ongoing. It was snowing. He went inside. And a woman asked if he was there to bid the parcels. Why, yes he replied, and she handed him a bidding paddle, and he became known as Bitter 70. He sat down to bid on the oil and gas drilling rights to more than 150,000 acres of public lands in Utah. In that moment, Tim showed us, in his own words, what love looks like. 
He stepped into the open space of democracy and he entered the BLM auction only to outbid the oil and gas executives that had gathered to buy our public lands for $2 an acre. These were lands adjacent to Arches National Park and Canyon lands, lands that Tim has known and loved well. Tim bid the parcels up to fair market value, winning over 14, winning 14 leases of 22,500 acres at a price of just $1.8 million. The auction had indeed been disrupted by a young activist who cared about the lands and cared about a livable future that did not include fossil fuels. Call it an act of civil disobedience. He was arrested for criminal fraud. A few months later, as you know, Secretary of the Interior Salazar deemed this auction illegal by the outgoing Bush administration for insufficient environmental impact statements. But our judicial system under the under Judge D. Benson in a federal court of law would find Tim De Christopher guilty on two felony charges for violation of the Federal Offshore Oil and Gas Leasing Reform Act and for making false statements. Tim refused to entertain any type of plea bargain. I want to share with you a letter that Tim wrote to me um, February 10th of 2010. Dear Terry, in our conversation about the movement, I kept thinking back to the Freedom Riders film I saw at Sundance last week. The power of that film stood in stark contrast to the hesitancy of green films like Climate Refugees. I feel like Freedom Riders represent everything that the climate movement is missing. Commitment, sacrifice, boldness, and confrontation. There were more lessons in this film that I can even count. The facts of this film blow away a lot of the movement conventional wisdom that holds us back. I'm still processing a lot of it, but here are a few of the things that I gleaned from it. One, motivation. We're always told that people need to feel personally threatened by the climate crisis in order to act, but some of the key figures in the film were white students in Tennessee who were not threatened in any way by the status quo, yet they made a bold commitment to ride into certain danger in the Deep South. They dropped out of school during finals and literally signed their wills and last testaments before they left. Nonviolence. The film clarified a difference between nonviolence and avoidance of violence. The freedom writers who were deeply committed to nonviolence were also clearly and intentionally inciting violence against themselves. They saw that as a necessary part of escalating the situation so that it could no longer be ignored. Politics. There were a lot of unintentional correlations between Obama and the Kennedys, who didn't really want to have to deal with civil rights. The activists involved knew they had to create so much social upheaval that Kennedy would have to pick sides, which was a huge political risk. Nothing about the political situation favored the Freedom Riders. Targets. They weren't even trying to change the minds in the South. They were using the closed-minded antagonists in the South to escalate the tension until the federal government had to intervene. Sacrifice. This really puts our movement in perspective. I don't know of a single one of us in this movement have committed anything close to the level of sacrifice that the Freedom Riders did. He goes on and then talks about, finally, numbers. The Freedom Riders were vastly outnumbered everywhere they went, but when they rallied the whole movement in Birmingham, they were outnumbered, but it didn't matter. At the peak, there were a few hundred riders, but they achieved major national legal changes that ended formal segregation despite immense political opposition. I think these lessons are invaluable to our movement right now, Tim wrote. There is no doubt that the climate movement has failed. The hard truth is that we have failed not because conservatives are stupid, but because liberals are cowards. It seems like the vast majority of people supporting the climate movement are very comfortable in their lives and it's nearly impossible to change the world when we are committed to keeping our own lives the same. That's why rich people make such terrible activists. <laughs> this all brings me back to what you and I talked about on the phone. We should not avoid the despair. We must let ourselves be shattered by the hopelessness of the crisis. When we abandon the hope that brings that things will work out, the hope that we will able, be able to live the easy and comfortable life which, which we are promised, the hope that someone else will solve this problem. When we give those up, then we're free to act. I certainly don't have all the answers, Terry, for how we make sure despair turns into action rather than despondency. 
but I do believe that together we can find those answers if we are willing to deal openly and honestly with the truth about the crisis and the truth about ourselves. Tim to Christopher, a year before he was sentenced on July 26, 2011, to two years in federal prison. Tim was released on Earth Day 2013 of this year, having completed his sentence in Harlong Federal Prison Camp, California and Inglewood, Colorado. He is on parole for three more years. Tim De Christopher has put a new face on climate change. When Henry David Thoreau said, cast your whole vote, not a strip of paper merely, but your whole influence. Tim De Christopher has laid his body down for what most of us simply talk about. Please welcome our beautiful friend, Tim De Christopher. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. And I'm so glad that Terry dug up that old letter. Um, I had I'd totally forgotten that I'd ever written that. Um, and it seems like so long ago now, and, and it's such a different point. Um, and uh, I feel like at that time, I was just beginning to grapple with some of those issues that, that were listed in that letter. Um, and, and some of those defining factors about our movement um, and learning some of those lessons of social movements in the past. And, and I think our, the rest of the climate movement has been as well. And, and just since 2010, since beginning of 2010, there's been such a tremendous shift in the climate movement. And, and we're in this huge period of transition right now. And, and I think that timing, that period of transition that we've been in, um, has been so important to my story. Um, you know, I think that, that the way my story has, has shaped uh, and, and turned out has had, had so much to do with this point in history that we've been at and, and the point that the, the climate movement has been at. You know, I think when we write the history of the climate movement one day, we'll look back at 2009 as one of the key turning points. Um, it, it, was, it was a shift in a lot of ways um, and in some ways that we're only beginning to understand the implications of. Uh, up until 2009, we had a movement that, that was following a strategy of appeasement, uh, one, one which said that in, in order to create change, we have to appeal to those at the very top of our power structure, and we have to make our movement be non-threatening to, to those at the top. Um, we have to present this uh, in terms of reducing our emissions and keeping pretty much everything else about our society the same. And, and that strategy failed catastrophically. Um, there were certainly people that were arguing against that strategy for a long time beforehand. Um, people developing other theories of change, people putting that into action with the, with the climate justice movement. Um, but a lot of that was held back by, by the big green groups that were focused on Washington, D.C. And, and they kind of kept everybody else in check for a long time by saying, listen, we know how to create change. We know what's politically feasible. Uh, we, we know how to get things done, so you've got to do it our way. We understand that you might not agree with this, but we know what's politically feasible. Uh, and it turns out they didn't know what was politically feasible um, <laughs> because they couldn't get done even their, um, their highly compromised cap and trade bill that probably would have been a step backwards anyway. Um, they couldn't get anything done in, in Copenhagen at the end of 2009. Um, and, and that was a really liberating moment for, for the climate movement. Um, it, was, it was disappointing in so many ways. Uh, but it was really liberating for an alternative theory of change to, to rise to the forefront of the climate movement. And, and that was a theory of change that, that looked back at our social movement history, at things like the Freedom Riders and the women's suffrage movement, and said, in order to create change, we have to pressure those in power, not appease those in power. Uh, that, that if we want things to get done, we need to be confrontational. And so it was the beginning of, of a more confrontational climate movement. Um, 
And there were a lot of implications of that. Uh, one was that we suddenly had a lot of new allies um, and, and we're, we're still in that period of transition. Um, one of the uh, perhaps self-destructive things that I've always done as an activist is sign up for as many email lists as I can <laughs> get myself on. Um, but, it's, but it's allowed me to, to keep my finger on, on, the, on the pulse of uh, what the movement is talking about. Um, and, and it was always so frustrating. Up, up through the end of 2009, um, there were so many climate groups that, that I got their emails. And when they would brag about what they were doing in the, in the standard format of, uh, this is what we've done, we're gonna keep doing it, so send us money. Um, their, their, the part that they would brag about was that they had made these alliances with big corporations. Um, they'd say, you know, we're sitting down with Shell and BP and DuPont uh, with the US Climate Action Partnership um, and you know, we've got a seat at the table with these big corporations. Um, they were celebrating those kind of alliances. And, and by having those alliances, it really walled us off from having other sorts of alliances. Um, because that power structure, um, in addition to being responsible for uh, so much of the destructive impacts on our climate and our environment, were also the, the same power structure that was oppressing a lot of other groups of people in our society and was responsible for so many other types of injustices. Uh, so there were a lot of other folks that were, that were pushing to change the world that, that looked at those alliances and said, well, if you're with those guys, then you're not with us. And, and so that really isolated the climate movement and weakened us for a long time. And, and once we pushed off those alliances and, and turned towards a more confrontational theory of change, um, we had, we had all these other activists that uh, were, were suddenly open to working with us. And, and there's been sort of a slow process there of gaining the trust uh, of those other social justice movements um, and, and showing them that, that we're actually serious about our, our theories of climate justice. Um, and, but we've been making inroads in these areas. Um, and I think a lot of that is because the, the change in strategy that we've had. Um, because it opened us up to having much broader goals. Um, when, when we were focused on that theory of change of, that focused on appeasement, uh, we, we were limited to, to this very narrow change um, that wasn't actually in line with most of our vision. Um, it, was, it was a cleaner, greener version of the world that we have now, um, which wasn't actually very exciting to a lot of people. Um, m even most of the people who were promoting that in the climate movement, um, that's not really what they felt. Um, there were a lot of other things that that they all wanted to change about our society as well. A lot of other injustices that they wanted to correct. And, and so once we abandoned that strategy, suddenly they, they started saying, um, well, let's, let's think about the world that we really wanna have and, and let's find a way to make that possible. And so we switched from this strategy that started from what we were told was politically feasible by Washington experts. And we went to one where we said, Let's, let's start from what the science tells us is necessary and what conscience tells us is desirable and find a way to make it politically feasible. And, and once we started to do that, we started to connect with, with our shared vision of a healthy and just world. And, and so we, we then started connecting with all the other people who had visions of, of healthy and just worlds uh, and had been fighting for quite a long time to, to bring those into reality. And, and so we, we started making those uh, those alliances, but it turned out to be somewhat of a rocky road of, of building trust. Um, and I think we're still right in the middle of that. Um, we're still just beginning to see some of the consequences um, of, of this shift in strategy of, of building new alliances. Um, and, and we're having to confront some of our own issues in, in coming into this uh, as, as coming from a privileged movement. And, and now we're suddenly working with a lot of traditionally oppressed groups. Um, there, there's a lot of introspection that the climate movement has had to go through uh, about the, the privilege that we bring to the table uh, in, in these dialogues with other social justice movements. And, and we're just beginning to, to explore um, how to deal with that in a healthy way. Um, and, I, and I think that's part of the path that, that lies ahead of us is how do we, how do we nurture these relationships? And, and that's part of the, the new challenge and the new way of thinking um, that's part of this paradigm shift for the climate movement. Because up to, the, up to 2009, we hadn't had to worry about nurturing relationships very much because we weren't actually acting like a social movement. We were much more of just a collection of, of lobbying groups. Um, and, 
and it was mostly professionals in the movement um, that, that was not very grassroots or, or volunteer driven. Um, and, and so we didn't have to worry much about uh, relationships. And, and now we do. Um, and we, it turns out that that's more difficult. Um, it's more difficult to nurture relationships uh, than to just pay somebody to repeat your talking points. And, and, uh, and so that's been a difficult process for us, but one that um, has made us much more powerful as a resistance movement and also much more resilient to, to what lies ahead of us. Um, and, and I think that's one of the most important parts of this, this whole paradigm shift that this movement has had is that along with being more resistant, we've also become more resilient. And, and that's one of the reasons why 2009 was such a key turning point for, for this movement. Um, if anybody else was on a lot of those email lists in 2009, um, you'll remember we got a lot of emails that said, this is our last best chance. This is our last real chance to turn things around uh, before it's too late. This is, this is our last chance to stop catastrophic climate change and runaway climate change. And that was right, it was, and we failed. And, and so now we've been in this, uh, this period where more and more of us have been grappling with the fact that, that it is too late to, to stop catastrophic climate change. And, and that we are on track for, for very rapid and intense change. Um, and we've had to grapple with what that means for it, that it's too late. Uh, it certainly doesn't mean that, that everything is over. Um, it doesn't mean that everything is gonna end. What it means is that we, we are pretty much guaranteed to go through a period of intense change. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainties in that and, and there's a lot of different ways that that can look. And there's, there's a lot of opportunity in that period of intense change to build a world that's more in line with, with our shared values than the one that we have now. Um, and, and so that's, that's opened up uh, our, our freedom to explore that vision. Um, and, and, it, and, has, uh, and has pushed us into dealing with what it means to be resilient. Um, the, the generation before us has had this, uh, this historical anomaly in which people haven't really needed people. This, this historical anomaly where the, the traditional dependence on other people has been replaced with a dependence on a, a really extreme consumption of material resources. And um, that's, that's certainly unusual historically, but for the last 50 or 100 years, especially in this country, um, that's the way we've lived by and large, uh, is in a way that we haven't really needed other people. And, and one of the things, one of the consequences of it being too late is that we are entering a world where we're gonna need people again. And we're gonna need to know how to nurture those relationships. And we're gonna need to know how to come into those situations as people of privilege uh, with people who have been traditionally exploited. And, and so even as, as these, this new paradigm has been challenging to, to a lot of us in the climate movement, um, it's also putting us on a path to, more, to deal more, more productively uh, with, with the inevitable consequences of climate change that we're gonna be dealing with. And one of the, the most visible um, shifts in, in the movement, uh, the, one of the most visible consequences of this paradigm shift has, has been the embrace of new tactics, particularly civil disobedience. And, and that's, been, that's been a shift that I've been uh, a part of through the, throughout this whole time, um, you know, because immediately after my, my action I, at the end of 2008, uh, I suddenly got this national platform and, and I was talking a lot about civil disobedience, uh, a lot about the role that it's played historically in our social movements, um, why it's important to challenge those in power. And, uh, and I got a lot of great response from people that weren't professional environmentalists. Uh, I got, I got a, lot of, a lot of great response from people outside of the environmental movement and from the rank and file of the movement that was ready for, for more confrontational tactics, ready to take a stand. Um, but uh, professional environmentalists hated me at that point. Um, they looked at me like I was a turd in the punch bowl, trying to, trying to ruin the, the agenda that, that they had been working on for years by talking about civil disobedience. And, and now there's been this tremendous shift just in the last few years where civil disobedience is now embraced by the mainstream of, of the climate movement. Um, 
and and even the Sierra Club now is participating in, in civil disobedience, um, you know, which is a drastic shift from the days of Carl Pope traveling around the country with the CEO of Chesapeake Energy, promoting natural gas. Um, and so so we've we've had this tremendous shift, but again we're just beginning to grapple with the implications of it and the consequences of it. Um, you know, some of us for, for years have been pushing the movement in this direction of, of engaging with civil disobedience. Um, and even though there's been some acceptance of it, I, th I don't think there's been a very deep understanding of it, uh, a deeper understanding of um, what civil disobedience really is and what it's really valuable for. Um, there's been embrace of it as a tactic for, for pressuring those at the top of the power structure, uh, which is certainly one important role for civil disobedience, um, of putting pressure on people like Obama um, and, and congressional leaders and things like that. Um, but we haven't really tapped into it as, as a power for education or as a power for movement building. And, and those were two of the big things that I learned that I didn't really understand until I went through this whole process over the past few years. Um, you know, one of the things that surprised me being in Utah in, a, in an extremely conservative area um, was, was how many people really wanted to, to talk to me in a serious way about my experience and why I would put myself in that position. Even people who would start by coming up to me and saying, well, I don't really agree with any of your policies, but uh, I really like the way you're doing things. And, and then they would ask me questions. Um, and, and they were actually open to what I was saying. And um, that was unusual being a climate activist where I've dealt with that intellectual barrier that people put up so often, where they say, oh, that's a, that's a liberal issue. I don't want to hear about that. And no matter what information you throw at them, they block it with that intellectual barrier. Um, it, it was shocking to suddenly have people um, be genuinely interested and open in what I was talking about because they saw this person putting themselves in harm's way. And I think there's just a natural inclination when you see another human being putting themselves in harm's way to try to understand why. And, and so rather than getting blocked by that intellectual barrier, they, they were trying to understand me on a very emotional level, on a human level. And, and getting through at that level of the human story opened them up and then they were more open to, to the information that I was giving them as well. Um, and and the, the genuine concerns about climate change that put me in that position in the first place. Uh, so there's all this, this education um, that comes from it, but the, the opportunity for that education only comes when people are making an actual sacrifice and taking actual risk. Um, there, there has to be the, the actual risk, not just perceived risk, which is so much of what um, our current movement is doing with sort of the photo op style civil disobedience now, um, where everything is prearranged and the, the cops will draw a little box and they say, if you stand in this box, uh, we'll give you three warnings and then we'll handcuff you and we'll take you to the station, we'll process you and you'll pay a hundred dollar citation and, and you can go back and, and read about it in the newspaper the next day. Um, and, and we've been substituting perceived risk for actual risk. And, and by doing that, we've missed out on, on part of the, the opportunity for education. Um, and we're also missing out on the opportunity for movement building. Um, and, and that's been, for me, the most, the most uh, personally powerful part of, of, my, of this whole experience was the people who, who flocked to support me and, and to hold on to me throughout this whole experience. Um, and it happened immediately. I mean, the, the next morning after the auction, um, I was getting emails and phone calls and people were connecting with me in any way that they could. Um, a lot of people that I didn't know, a lot of people that weren't coming from the climate movement uh, and weren't environmentalists were, were coming to, to support me. And, and we built the organization Peaceful Uprising um, shortly after that, about a month later with, with a lot of these folks that came to, to support me. Um, and, and there was a lot of consistent support both with Peaceful Uprising and with my Unitarian Church throughout that whole experience. And, and one of the things that I noticed um, was that a lot of the people who were most dedicated uh, in, in supporting me through that experience um, weren't active in the climate movement beforehand. A lot of the people who, who came to support me and supported me most consistently were women around my mother's age. <laughs> and, and I started to realize that, um, that their support, um, certainly they were concerned about climate issues, um, and they were concerned about land issues, um, but they also saw me uh, 
in, in a way that related me to their, their children. Um, they saw me like, like one of their own children, and they saw that, that I was in trouble, um, that I was in over my head. Um, they saw that I was actually in a very vulnerable position and that I actually needed help. And, and so a lot of them came in and offered that help that I desperately needed um, and, and got me through that whole situation. And, and I think we've underestimated that, that, that power of being needed to help someone else in this movement. Um, and, and in order to tap into that and, and to really engage those people with the movement, uh, we have to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. We have to have that actual risk once again. Um, the, the perceived risk just doesn't cut it when it comes to that powerful aspect of movement building, of, of drawing people in. Um, and uh, I've even started to experience that myself. Um, you know, maybe that means that I'm getting older or something, but, uh, you know, I just went back to school at Harvard Divinity School, and, um, you know, I'm in a position now of uh, having to say no to, to good causes all the time. Um, every week I'm saying no to, uh, to activists um, because I don't have the capacity uh, to, to get involved. Um, and, and there's a divestment movement going on uh, at Harvard University to divest their endowment from fossil fuels, as there are at a lot of universities. Um, and, uh, and I didn't expect to get very involved in that. Um, I figured I might be loosely involved. Um, and I started looking into it a little bit when I, when I got there um, and saw that the tone coming from the administration um, was one that was profoundly disrespectful and, and disempowering uh, to, these, to these college students. Um, that they, they were trying to derail the issue. They, they wouldn't answer um, what the campaign was really about. They wouldn't answer the, the issues that these kids were bringing to the table. Um, and they were responding with things like, you know, if you want to make a difference, maybe you should go thank BP for their, their investments in renewable energy. Um, <laughs> not only profoundly ignorant statements like that, um, but really disempowering statements um, that, that said a lot to these young people about their ability to make a difference in the world um, and their ability to have power over institutions. And, and as somebody who has spent so much of my time trying to empower young people, uh, it really pisses me off to see that. Um, I mean, it, it pisses me off to see that from politicians, but to see that from education officials um, who have, have, have a responsibility for nurturing young people, uh, that's just unacceptable to me. And, and the thing that, uh, that pushed me over the line to get involved with that uh, divestment campaign um, was an article that um, the administration of Harvard had organized in the New York Times um, that, uh, that was supposedly about the, divest the student divestment campaign, but it really only uh, gave viewpoints from the opponents of that campaign um, to try to distract from what the issue was really about um, and redefine it on their own terms. And they had uh, this big picture uh, of Chloe Maxman, a, a junior at Harvard, um, at the top of the article, uh, one of the leaders of the divestment campaign. Um, this nice, big, cute, smiling picture of her, um, but she never got a chance to have a voice in the article. There was not a single word from her, um, and her viewpoint was nowhere represented in the entire article. Um, they had a picture of her and only gave voice to her critics. Um, and I thought, you know, aside from being terrible one-sided journalism, um, what kind of message is this sending, um, particularly to, to young women and, and young female activists that, you know, here, sit here and look cute, um, but, but you're not gonna have the right to speak. You know, you know sit there and, and we'll take your picture, uh, but keep quiet because adults are talking over here. Um, and that, that just pissed me off so much um, that I had to get involved. And I said, all right, I'm in this divestment campaign um, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm gonna be a part of it now. Um, and, and, and there's that, there's that tremendous potential, um, for civil disobedience to bring people into the movement like that and, and to tap into that sort of sentiment. Um, and we're missing out on it when, when we only have photo op style civil disobedience. Um, and, and one of the other big, uh, shortcomings that, that we're just now grappling with, um, that, 
that we haven't really understood about civil disobedience in this movement um, is that not everybody is gonna be satisfied with just photo op style civil disobedience. That when we tell people it's time to take a stand, when we tell people that we're a confrontational movement now and we need to challenge power, when we tell people that this is worth taking risks and we need to fight back, there are gonna be people who actually do it. And, and we've, been, we've been calling for that for quite a while and we're getting more and more of a response now um, of people really taking a stand. And you know, this, this summer, we had a lot of those calls for action coming out from a bunch of different groups. We had, we had the summer heat campaign calling people to, to engage in civil disobedience. We had the, the fearless summer campaign with a lot of organizations asking people to, to get engaged. Um, all these different calls for action. Um, and people responded. On, on the first day of fearless summer, there, there was a, a guy named Chris Wamhoff in Michigan that wedged himself into the Edinburgh pipeline. Um, and, um, you know, and I'm somebody who, who follows these issues. Um, and until that happened, I didn't actually realize that Enbridge had taken the opportunity after their 2010 spill into the Kalamazoo River to greatly expand and reroute their pipeline with no in permits or environmental analysis under the guise of repairing their pipeline. Um, so, so he and a bunch of other folks in, in Michigan uh, have been fighting back against that. The first day of Fearless Summer, um, he, he wedged himself in the pipeline and shut it down for the whole day. Um, and, uh, and I found about, about that from all these environmental listservs that I'm still on. Um, I got all these emails celebrating this, um, saying, you know, look at this, people are taking action. You know, we put out this call for action and people are responding. Look at this great action in Michigan where this guy shut down this pipeline. Um, we're gonna continue more of that, so send us your money. Um, I, got a, I got a bunch of those emails from a bunch of different organizations. Um, and, then, and then a month later, some of Chris's friends up in Michigan um, shut down Enbridge again and locked down to a bunch of the construction equipment there, kept it shut down for another day. Um, you know, and again, I got some emails, oh, that's great, look at, you know, it's, it's such a, we've got such a strong movement now, send us money. Um, and, uh, and then we found out a few months later that, that all those folks got charged with felonies and that they want to take their case to trial to, to keep this, this, uh, this issue in front of the public, to make the most out of this opportunity. Um, and, I, and I certainly saw with my case that, um, that that's where the biggest part of the opportunity is, is, is taking it to trial. Um, you know, I, I saw fairly early on that, that plea bargains played two roles, um, that they uh, removed the public, they removed citizens from, from the legal process um, and concentrated all the power in the hands of judges and prosecutors, um, which for somebody who is an activist trying to engage people um, with involvement in their government and wants to encourage civic engagement, um, certainly taking a plea bargain um, is, is, op uh, is the opposite of, of those goals uh, of encouraging civic engagement. Um, and then the other thing that they do is that they resolve an issue quickly and quietly and out of the public view. And, and for an activist, certainly this is, again, opposed to uh, our interests, um, especially somebody who engaged in civil disobedience for the very purpose of bringing an issue in, in front of the public. Um, and then once I got locked up, uh, once I went to prison um, and talked to a lot of other folks and, and heard all of their stories, I realized that um, there, was a, there was a third uh, really important part uh, a, a really important thing that, that plea bargains accomplished. And that was that they fast-tracked mass incarceration. That plea bargains are the means, the, the logistical means of how we can put millions of people through that system, how we can lock up millions of people in this country. That that would simply be logistically impossible um, and politically unfeasible to, to have millions of jury trials every year with the millions of people that we put through that system. Um, and I realized then that uh, plea bargains were more than just uh, a personal choice, but they were also a political choice that affected all the other people that were being sucked into the justice system. Um, and, and so I was, I was excited to, to engage uh, with these folks that actually wanted to take their case to trial um, and wanted to, to keep pushing the boundaries in those ways. Um, and, and I think that's part of the next steps for this movement um, is to learn how to carry civil disobedience all the way through. And, and to take full advantage uh, of that organizing opportunity and, and of that cultural and legal shift opportunities that, that are wrapped up in, in civil disobedience. Um, and, 
And so I was disappointed to see that a lot of the climate movement uh, had forgotten these folks, that the climate movement had sort of moved past them. Um, and, and these actions were organized by, by a small grassroots group um, in, in Michigan that didn't have big bu budgets and big foundation support. Um, and, and a lot of the big organizations that had put out these calls for action um, to which these people had responded to, they'd sort of moved on to, to the next campaign and the next stage of, of the movement. Um, and, and they'd forgotten that there are people who hadn't moved on, that there were people still fighting those battles. Um, and, and right now, that's, that's up in the air. Um, that's, that's up in the air of what kind of movement that we're gonna be in, in the climate movement, um, of whether we're gonna be the kind of movement that leaves people behind or the kind of movement that holds on to people, that, that holds people up and amplifies the, the power of their voice and, and holds people tightly to support them through their times of struggle. And, you know, the, the possibility of us being a movement that, that leaves people behind, um, I think is, is real um, and, and disappointing. I think it would make us less effective um, in that, you know, we're gonna need more people taking a stand. We're gonna need more people putting themselves on the line. Um, and they need to see that we're the kind of movement that supports people, that doesn't leave people behind. So if we want more of these actions, we need to support the people who take them, um, just in terms of being an effective movement. Um, but on a much deeper level, um, that, that kind of movement that leaves people behind uh, is a movement that I wouldn't want to be a part of, and that I think a lot of us wouldn't want to be a part of, and a movement that I think would leave us very vulnerable in our future. Um, it, it goes back to that connection between resistance and resilience, that, that being the kind of movement that holds on to people and, and doesn't let them go, that's the kind of movement that builds resilience for, for a catastrophic future that lies ahead of us. And, and it's the kind of movement that I think people actually want to be a part of, to reconnect with one another again. Um, and, uh, and, it's, and it's hanging in that balance right now um, of whether or not we're going to support these folks in Michigan um, and whether or not we're going to be that kind of movement. Um, and, and again, um, we're kind of stumbling and, and grasping uh, with the implications of this paradigm shift in the movement, of this shift towards being a confrontational movement that engages in confrontational strategies like, like civil disobedience. And, and we're, again, just like in, uh, in dealing with our new allies and the struggles of gaining trust with the social justice movements, um, we're, we're, again, dealing with some of the, the legacies of, of the recent decades of the environmental movement. Um, because at, at this point, for the last generation or so, um, the, a lot of these environmental organizations, a lot of the big climate groups now, have been born and bred in, in a period of expediency um, and, when, and with policies of expediency that, that looked rather short term at what their narrow interests of, of their organizations are. And, and so they're, they're looking at um, how their campaigns work right now and realizing that you know, they can't get stuck on their last call to action. They need to keep moving forward. They need to have new campaigns and things like that. Um, and, and for them, the expediency calls for them to just move on. And, and you know, this, is, this is a bigger issue that we're gonna be dealing with more and more. Because when we look at, at some of the threats to our future, some of the, the impacts of climate change that we're gonna be dealing with, um, there, there is a certain perspective um, that says the reasonable way to deal with that is, is to sell out. You know, that when we look at, at these dramatic consequences that our society is gonna be dealing with, um, there's, there's a reasonable way to, of responding that says, well, if that's the case, um, if we're gonna be dealing with these impacts and we're not gonna be able to support everyone on this planet, then I've gotta protect me and mine. And, and link up with the biggest corporation that's gonna protect me um, and provide me with the resources that I can wall myself off and protect me and my, my loved ones. Um, and that's, that's sort of a reasonable way to, to approach our future. Um, but it's not a humane one. 
It's not one that will preserve our humanity as we navigate that period of change. I think what we're going to need as we go into this dangerous and, and chaotic period, we're going to need an unreasonable morality, an unreasonable morality that holds on to people. Even when, when we can't see the, the expedient reason for doing so, even when it might not be the most efficient way to deal with it, and, and we can't see how it's going to pay off for us or our organization or our NGO, even when we can't see how that's going to pay off and, and, and help our own campaigns, we still need to hold on to those people, even when it seems like the unreasonable thing to do. Because that's the kind of movement that we're going to need, that's the kind of society that we're going to need to deal with these impacts. We're going to need a society with unreasonable morality. And, and we're in the process right now of, of grappling with that and, and trying to figure out what that unreasonable morality is going to look like. We're grappling with a new way of being in the world. And, and it, it's coming from a lot of young people um, who, are, who are grappling with this, who have looked at their parents' generation and, and seen that, that our parents were, they, they achieved that goal of comfort and convenience more so than any generation in the, in the history of the world. That they, they were, they had that model of success. They achieved that model of success and they were miserable by and large. That, that that extreme consumption of material resources seemed to go hand in hand with an extreme consumption of antidepressants. <laughs> and, and so a lot of young people grew up with that example, that, that that goal that we're told to seek of material resources, of comfort and convenience, that goal doesn't actually work. And so a lot of people have, have grown up looking for a different way. And, and that generation just now is, is coming of age, looking for a different way to live in the world, looking for a different vision to seek, and, and a different way to relate to one another, um, a, a different way of building community. Um, and I think, I think the Occupy movement was one of those grasping um, explorations of, of a new way to relate in society. And, and there were certainly a lot of frustrating things about that. Um, for, for a lot of the observers of, of the Occupy movement and, and probably a lot of uh, frustrating things for the participants in the Occupy movement with that. But it was an exploration of new ways to relate to one another and new ways of relating to the world. Um, it was certainly frustrating for me to uh, see the, the biggest social movement in this country in my lifetime uh, while I was in prison and have to watch it on TV uh, and not be able to participate. Um, at, but I think it was frustrating for a lot of other folks as well. And, and I think a lot of other folks um, looked at it and said, what are these, what are these people doing? Like they're, they're spending all this time just sitting around and talking. And, and I think probably some of the, the participants that I've talked to had that same frustration of, you know, what are we doing spending so much time just sitting here talking? And it turns out that, that what they were doing was was exploring new ways of relating to one another and also preparing themselves for their future. And, and, and a lot of us didn't really understand um, what the, the Occupy movement was doing until Hurricane Sandy happened. And, and then we saw why something like that could actually be important and, and why it was worthwhile to explore new ways of relating to one another, new ways of building community. Because we've, we've seen a couple of really dramatic uh, and visual representations of, of what climate change looks like over the past few years in the form of hurricanes. One with Hurricane Katrina that hit New Orleans, and one with, with Hurricane Sandy that, that hit the East Coast. And, and they could not be more stark differences between, what, between the consequences uh, of those two hurricanes. That, that each of them, when the hurricane hit, it kind of left this void um, where it, it blasted everything out of its way and left a void. And, and with Hurricane Katrina, the first thing to fill that void was military power and corporate power. The, the first thing to rush in was the military, uh, chasing people through the streets, um, breeding division, breeding fear. And, and then corporations rushed in to privatize public services, privatize schools, uh, get rid of public housing, um, and generally build corporate power. And, and part of the legacy of Hurricane Katrina was 
the, the increase of corporate power and the fracturing of communities, um, spreading people out, um, breeding division between people, breeding division between people and government. Um, and and the, the difference with Occupy Sandy um, couldn't have been more stark because with, when Sandy hit, the first thing to flow into that void was Occupy and, and the networks and relationships that had been built in the Occupy movement. And, and they were on the ground everywhere that that hurricane hit. Um, and, and they were surprisingly well organized. They had over 20,000 people on the ground providing relief as part of the Occupy movement. It was actually the biggest relief organization ever in history. And, and they were so well organized, so well entrenched, that, well, that when FEMA and the Red Cross showed up with truckloads of food and, and medical supplies, they actually called the, the leaders of Occupy and said, we've got all this stuff, but we don't know exactly where it needs to go. And the Occupy folks said, well, we know where it go needs to go because we've got people in every single neighborhood. We know exactly where it needs to go and where the need is the greatest. And FEMA and, and the Red Cross gave their truckloads of supplies to Occupy. And so Occupy was the ones that were handing this out. They were the ones that were actually providing relief and, and building community at the same time because they were the front lines that, that, were, that were dealing with the people that had been impacted by this disaster. And so they had this opportunity to, to really connect with people and to fill that void with people power and with community power. Um, my favorite story that, that came out of that um, was there was uh, a young man that was shoveling out uh, basements and um, he, he was in one of the neighborhoods that the culture of this neighborhood was cops and firefighters. That's who mostly lived there, it was a lot of cops and firefighters. And, and so he was shoveling out this basement and the homeowner came up and, and started talking to him. And, and right away this kid recognized the homeowner because the guy that owned that house was the cop who would beat him up in Zuccotti Park. <laughs> and the kid said, do you recognize me? And the cop said, no, I don't, should I? And, and the kid said, yeah, because you beat me up in Zuccotti Park. You hit me with your nightstick and I had to go to the hospital. And, and the cop said, I'm so sorry. And, and they began talking about it. And the kid explained why he was there. Um, you know, the, one of the things the cop was asking was, you know, what are you doing shoveling out my basement? And, and so that led the kid into talking about his vision of the world and, and what Occupy really meant to him and how it was about building community and building people power in this way and, and taking responsibility for our own society and, and creating it more in line with our shared values and shared vision. And, and so they had this moment of connection and, and the cop apologized and they finished shoveling out his basement. And, and that, that example couldn't be more different than the example of National Guard and police shooting people on roof, rooftops and shoot, chasing people through the streets and shooting people in the back that, that, bred, that bred animosity um, and, and fear of, of, uh, of one another. Uh, instead, we found that disasters could be opportunities for healing those divisions um, and, and for confronting police violence. Um, that, that would have been unthinkable uh, after Katrina. Um, if anybody would have said, well, disasters like that could be great opportunities for you know, confronting inherent police violence. Um, people would have said, oh, that's crazy. Are you kidding? Look, it just, it just spread more police violence in, in disasters like that. Um, but, there's, but there's different possibilities uh, of how we can deal with that disaster. And, and, and that's one of the things that uh, encourages me about our future is that everything is up in the air um, and we know we can't hold on to the, to the status quo any longer. That's the, that's the reality of what it means to, to be too late, is that um, we know we're gonna have to let go of the status quo. But there's a lot of opportunities for what kind of world we're gonna create to replace the status quo. And, and none of that is inevitable. And, and you know, that's what we see with the two examples between Katrina and Sandy, that, that there are very different roads that we could go down, and neither one of them is inevitable. That, that if we're organized and empowered, 
that if we have these relationships and these networks and, and feel like we can take ownership over our society, that we can, we can respond to the inevitable struggles and hardships of climate change in a way that brings us closer together and strengthens our communities and, and strengthens our spirits. Um, or we can go down a very different, much darker path. Um, and both of those are real opportunities. And, and I think that's why it's so exciting to be an activist at this moment in history. Uh, that's, that's why I think activism right now is so important because we are at this turning point. We know we're gonna have to let go of the past and we're gonna have to let go of the status quo. And, and the choice before us now is not whether or not we're gonna hold on to the comfort and security of the status quo or, or embrace something new. The, the, the choice before us is what kind of new world are we gonna create? And, and we're gonna have to create a new world one way or another, either through our inactions that allow those at the top of the power structure to, to create their dystopic world, um, or through our active engagement and, and connection with one another, um, and our unreasonable morality that might not make sense at the time. It might not make sense of why we're spending this time connecting with one another and, and upholding these relationships, even when it's inconvenient. Um, that, that is a path that, that prepares us for our future. Um, and, and that's our choice. That's our choice right before us that um, we're making all the time. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that we should learn from Occupy Sandy is that when those disasters hit um, and, and it suddenly, sun, suddenly seems like our actions are very relevant, that's too late to, to be making that choice. That that choice of, of what kind of community was gonna be built there, uh, of, of how resilient that community was, made, was gonna be, that choice was made a year ahead of time. Um, when, when people were sitting in, in Zuccotti Park day after day. And, and the, the choice for, for our whole generation of how we're gonna deal with this period of, of change and chaos that lies ahead of us, that choice is not gonna be made when, when there's a big disaster that, that hits us. That choice is made right now. That choice is made right now when we decide what kind of movement are we gonna be. Are we gonna be the kind of movement that, that holds on to people or leaves people behind. We're making those choices every day in, in how we're gonna structure our movement, how we're gonna structure our society. And uh, I'm just really grateful to, to be a part of that right now. Um, I think it's a, it's a really exciting time to be alive and awake. And, and I'm glad that I could share a little bit of that with you here today. Um, and, uh, and I'm excited to, to bring Terry back up um, and, and have a, another conversation and explore what that new world is gonna look like. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. You inspire us. And I can certainly tell you that you have inspired me. I'd love to ask you to, to take us further with this notion of civil disobedience. And you talk about the distinguished history that it holds. Um, Henry David Thoreau refusing to pay his taxes, spending a night in jail. Um, because it would be contributing to war. Uh, certainly Gandhi with his salt march. Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement, the bridge across Selma, the freedom riders. Certainly um, acts of civil disobedience to stop nuclear testing at the Nevada test site. I'm wondering, we see it as a political strategy. I'm wondering what would happen if civil disobedience was not just 
a political strategy, but became a spiritual practice. What would that look like, and how do you see it happening? Um, yeah, that's certainly something that Gandhi talked a lot about, about the spiritual practice. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's also not separate from the political strategy. Um, you know, in the same way that the decisions about, you know, how we're going to shape our society down the road are being made right now in, in how we structure our movement and relate to one another, um, the, the ways that we engage in those opportunities for civil disobedience, um, that's going to be decided ahead of time um, with that spiritual practice that, um, you know, just like a practice of anything else, that it um, prepares you to react instantly, that um, you've already built up the, the preparation. Um, and, and so when those moments present themselves, um, you're ready to respond. Um, just like an, an athlete will train in the same motion over and over and over so that uh, it, at the, the time when he needs it in, in a game, uh, it's just second nature. Um, it's just the, the natural reaction of his body. Uh, you know, he doesn't have to think about it. I think it's the, the same way with the spiritual practice that leads to civil disobedience, that um, it prepares people internally so that, um, so that they don't really have to, you know, stop and, and think about it. Um, but what would know, that look like in specific terms? I mean, uh, it's interesting to me that, you know, when you commit civil disobedience, you go through nonviolence training, so to speak. Yeah. And that's a group gesture. But what was so stunning about your gesture of your practice of civil disobedience is that it was spontaneous. It was born out of the moment that everything in your life prior to that precise moment when she said, are you here to bid? And you said, well, yes, I am, um, enabled you to, to act. And, and a movement was created around you. So what, what are some of those preparations as we prepare for a new way of being with an embodied activism? Um, I think uh, it's not always done on the individual level. It's still done at the community. Um, I mean, in, in the film, I talk a lot about uh, what had happened with me over the course of 2008 um, of going through that period of despair, of dealing um, with the fact that uh, it was too late to stop a lot of climate change. Um, and, and that we were on track for, for these massive disruptions. Um, and, and there were other people going through that, that same period of despair with me, um, particularly people uh, at my church that were, were dealing with the same reality of climate change um, and, and having these same conversations about what to do with it. Um, and just as I was you know, studying social movement history over the course of that year, um, I was studying it with other people and talking to them and relating to them, relating to, you know, the climate movement um, and talking about the differences and, you know, what the climate movement is lacking that social movements in the past had. Um, this was all happening in dialogue with the community. Um, <laughs> and so even though I was the only one taking action in the auction room, um, I knew that when I was taking that action that I wasn't alone, that I had that network of people behind me. Um, you know, I knew who I was going to call. Um, and the thing is, um, th those people that I knew would be behind me on this, um, I could have counted them on my fingers at the time that I was in the auction room. Um, you know, I, I, I had no idea that there were thousands of people that would support this sort of thing. Um, you know, but I, I knew there, there were five. <laughs> um, <laughs> I knew who they were, and, and that was enough. Those, those five empowered me um, to know that I had their support. Um, and, and I think that's, um, that's one of the important things to remember about community is, you know, uh, I'll, in, in a lot of activism today, we're taught to focus so much on the numbers, you know, of like, uh, you know, how many millions of people signed this petition, how many you know, tens of thousands of people liked this cause on Facebook and, and stuff like that. Um, and, and we're taught to build up those, uh, we're, we're taught to put a lot of value in those numbers. Um, and, and we try to use those to empower people, 
You know, we say, oh, look at this big, powerful movement that you're a part of that has, you know, 30,000 likes on Facebook and, you know, this, this YouTube video just got watched, you know, 300,000 times. Um, but we didn't evolve to be empowered by avatars on a screen. We didn't, we didn't evolve to, to feel stronger and more powerful because of numbers on a screen. We, we evolved to feel powerful because of the people around us that we could touch and, and speak to and listen to and, and smell. You know, the, the people that we could sing with mm. were, was what empowered us uh, through our evolution. And there was nothing abstract about, you know, you're talking about abstract numbers and, and embodied practice. Mm -hmm. There was nothing abstract about what you did. I mean, you served two years in jail um, alone. Mm -hmm. What did you learn in prison? Um, I think prison really deepened my understanding of a lot of social justice issues. Um, you know, uh, I'd studied a lot of social justice issues. Um, I'd read a lot about mass incarceration and things like that. Um, but I'd always come from a fairly privileged background. And, and my time in prison was, was two years that I spent with one of the most oppressed populations of people in our society. Um, people who are not only oppressed in their current position, but largely got into that situation um, because they were disempowered or disenfranchised in one way or another. Um, and, and so experiencing that uh, deepened my, my understanding of social justice. Um, and I think will influence my activism move, moving forward. Um, and, it, and, and I also learned a lot about uh, the nature of power and, um, and about people having influence over their own society. Um, because perhaps more than any other uh, group of people that I've ever been a part of, inmates understand that the little world around themselves is a world that they create and, and that they have power over. Um, and, and perhaps because they don't have power over anything else in their lives, um, and, and they're very limited on what they control, um, that, that aspect that they can influence, that society among inmates, um, they guard very, very closely, and they, and they put a lot of effort into, uh, into creating the kind of society that they want there. Um, and, and even if they don't consciously understand it, they all, they all live out the, the truth that we have power over that which we take responsibility for. Um, and so there's this real intentional effort to take responsibility for their own society there. Um, you know, when I, when I first came into federal prison, um, you, can, you can't take anything with you. You come in buck naked. And uh, I, the prison officials gave me a poorly fitting jumpsuit and a pair of slippers and a bed number and said, okay, go. Um, and then the other inmates came over and, and they showed me where that bunk was, uh, introduced me to the other people around there. Um, they, they gave me real shoes and real clothes that actually fit. Um, they gave me a coffee mug and coffee and snacks and, and they toured me around the whole place and showed me where everything was, showed me how things worked, uh, explained all the rules to, to me and what I needed to watch out for and that sort of thing. Um, all, all of that came from the other inmates. Um, and, and I think it's because they understood that that's how they have power over their own society is they take responsibility for one another. Um, and, and, and I think that's the root of why it's so offensive in prison culture to uh, tell to the guards, to rat, to rat to the guards, um, because the guards have never done anything for an inmate. Um, they've never cared about that inmate beforehand, so they haven't earned that power that comes from resolving a situation. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, if people have a situation in prison, they, there's certainly people that they can tell. Um, they're just other inmates. They're the, they're the people who took responsibility for that inmate when he came in. Um, they're the ones who have, have a right to that power and a right to be resolving uh, situations. Um, and, and, and that was a, a lesson to me about, you know, how on a larger scale uh, we, we create that kind of society that... Um, that it begins with taking responsibility for one another, um, and and that's how we assert power over uh, our own society. So you talk about power 
you learned about power, about accountability, mm -hmm. about compassion, really taking care of each other. Talk to us about sacrifice. Were those two years a sacrifice for you? Um, in some ways. Um, I think it depends on, on how you define it. Um, you know, those, that, that time in prison, it, at times it was, it was very frustrating. Um, it was, uh, it was boring at times. Um, it was extremely inconvenient, um, but it wasn't horrible. Um, and, and there were parts of it, uh, that I learned a lot from, and I'm grateful for that. And, um, there, there were parts of it that were also fulfilling for me. Um, you know, prison is a very reflective sort of environment. Um, and, and being an introvert, uh, I, I kind of thrived in that environment a lot um, and spent a lot of time on myself. Um, you know, I think that's one of the reasons that I didn't write when I was in prison, even though I expected to. Um, you know, it seemed like the thing you're supposed to do when you go to prison as an activist, you're supposed to write. Um, but, uh, you know, I always had this sense of like, no, this is my time. Like, uh, I'm, this is like the time of input, you know, where I'm like recharging myself and I'm reading and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't really want to do any output right now. Um, and as your friend, I really saw that because <laughs> I feel like when, when I met you, you know, and certainly when I was watching news and here you were, and it was, it was such a gift because it was like, as a person being involved in the public lands movement, not a lot has happened, but suddenly you woke me up. And I remember the image of you, it, you did look like a deer in headlights in that moment of what's happening, all this attention. And then I remember at another point seeing you being raised up by the people supporting you. Mm -hmm. And then the anger, um, the uncertainty, the courts, you know, all of that, and the, the power, your voice. But I think what has moved me so much, Tim, is uh, when you got out, the sense of calm, the sense of reserve, and now your decision to go to divinity school. Um, perhaps you could talk to us about that, that when you talk to us about that we are at a time of a different way of being, of becoming, mm -hmm. how do you see divinity school being a bridge um, between a secular activism and a spiritual one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, uh, I've been conscious of that shift myself um, in in my own perspective, um, and that uh, and, and that so so much that I gained from this, um, and you know how much how much more at peace I actually feel now than I did before any of this, um, and that's why I say I'm not sure whether that counts as sacrifice or not. Mm -hmm. That um, I feel like I've gained so much more than I've lost. Uh, and um, I don't know if that fits in most people's definition of sacrifice. If you gain, mm -hmm. if you gain so much out of it, um, and you know, perhaps sacrifice is more to do with um, being willing to let go, um, and, and it doesn't always mean that you lose, um, but uh, you let go and then find that you get more in return. Um, so I've certainly experienced that, um, and I think my shift in perspective of uh, kind of grappling with these deeper issues um, has kind of gone hand in hand with, with some of the movement's shift in perspective. Um, you know, I think this, uh, this paradigm shift for the climate movement um, has meant that we, we're taking a much broader view now, um, that, you know, the, the challenge of the climate movement is no longer just how do we do reduce emissions, um, that's still something we need to do. Um, but now we also have this challenge of how do we maintain our humanity as we navigate this period of change? Um, how do we create a society that's more in line with our vision um, and our values? And um, that requires us to be connected to those values um, in a way that we haven't been in a while. Um, it, acquire, it requires us to be able to articulate that vision of a healthy and just world um, and, and what kind of principles are gonna guide it. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is, is spiritual work um, of, of tapping into those deeper values that, that we hold as individuals and those shared values that we hold a, as a community um, and learning how to talk about that again and, and opening up that dialogue uh, about what we really value. 
Um, and I think that's gonna be an important part of moving forward, um, both as a movement and, and, and as a society. Um, and, and so that's part of, I, I think that's a big reason of, of why uh, I'm going to Divinity School, to, um, to be a part of facilitating that dialogue um, about what we do really value um, and, and how we're gonna create our, our vision of a healthy and just world. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think that's also part of fighting back. Um, you know, I think that when, when I look at our opponents in this, um, the, the institutions of government and corporations um, that, that we're struggling against, um, I've, I've come to realize that their tool, their, their main weapon that they're using against us is the weapon of alienation. That, mm. uh, that that's, what, that's what they're using to oppress us, to, to weaken us, um, to, to make us more easily exploited. Um, and, and I think that's really a spiritual weapon in, in that it's designed to break people's spirits um, and, and to break them apart uh, from other people. And, and I think if we're gonna fight back against that, um, against that spiritual weapon of alienation, um, we're gonna have to have a spiritual defense, a spiritual resistance to that, um, that, um, that resists that, that tool of alienation um, and, and replaces it with, with community, with connection, with love. Um, it's so interesting, you know, when you talk about alienation, corporations, love, connectedness. Um, I just was at the Sullivan Gallery today, I was telling you, um, where there's an exhibit called News from Nowhere by two Korean artists, and their names are Moon Kun Kwan and Jean Jun Ho. And they'd made a film about a woman who was run, organized, held by a corporation. She left, her act of civil disobedience when she left that laboratory was when she was asked to study a twig, a tree, to remember that connected world. And once she felt that, hmm. she said she could never go back. And she left the corporation and began to create the world that had once been anew. Um, and I thought of you, you know, because I think it's that connection to wilderness, Tim. You know, when you talk about a spiritual tool, mm -hmm. um, maybe you could talk about the context of your act of civil disobedience, of, of America's Red Rock Wilderness and the lands that you bought, that you saved from exploitation. I, uh, um, I mean, I do think that was important for me, uh, and, and I don't think it was a coincidence that that act of civil disobedience happened um, right after I'd just spent two years living in the West Desert of Utah, spending most of my time out in the wilderness, um, working with the wilderness therapy program for, for teenagers. Um, that's why I originally came to Utah. Um, and, and so I'd spent so much of my time out there. And I think the, the impact that it had on me um, was that it reminded me that I was very small um, in, in that, uh, you know, I think when we spend all of our time in little rooms um, and in an enclosed city, um, we're very big in the spaces that, that we stand in. Um, and uh, so it's easy to think of ourselves as really big and really important um, and, and our problems as being really important because they fill the room. Um, and when we stand out in open areas and, and uh, can experience open spaces, um, we realize that we're actually really small. And, and to me, that's liberating and empowering, um, you know, to see that, um, that our little problems are, are very small in, in this larger world, um, and yet that we're connected to it. Um, and, and that at the same time that I'm very little um, in this very big world, um, my actions actually impact that very big world. Um, and, and I think it, it is that connection that you're talking about, of connection, connecting to the world outside of yourself. Um, and I think for some people that happens in the wilderness, for some people that happens um, connecting with other people, um, you know, seeing that, uh, 
that they themselves are, are a small part of this human community, and yet, as a small piece, they can have a big impact. Um, I think that's that's an empowering thing. Um, I think that's part of what you know led to my civil disobedience of, you know, seeing that, uh, you know, two years in prison for one little person is uh, a small price to pay to have a, a big impact on this bigger world. So I think about these words like humility, um, grace, that have both practical applications and spiritual ones. Words that have been used to describe you, courageous, fearless. So I guess I wanna ask you, and I've never asked you this as your friend, what scares you? Mm. <sighs> what are you afraid of? Um, you know, throughout the whole, uh, the whole legal process, I, I was always scared that, um, that my story would be one that scared other people into obedience. Um, and I think that was the government's goal. You know, they, they made that pretty clear, especially in my sentencing, um, that it was all about scaring other people into obedience. Um, and, uh, and that was my biggest fear during that time, that the legacy of my action uh, would be one of fear. Um, and, and that's why it was so important to me that uh, Peaceful Uprising was outside singing. Um, and, you know, something we got from, from you was that this case was all about intimidation and the best response to intimidation was joy and resolve. Mm -hmm. um, that was from a letter that you wrote uh, calling people to, to come to my trial. Um, and, and I think Peaceful Uprising really embodied that joy and resolve that whole time through my trial um, and, and made sure that the, the lasting legacy um, was one of empowerment, not one of fear. Um, and, uh, and I was really grateful for that. Um, uh, since then, um, I don't know what scares me the most now. <laughs> My last question, a phrase, it's been so wonderful to have this time to talk to each other because we haven't had time. You know, it's all we have is time. You serve time. Um, it's time together in, in a gathering like this. For the next three years, you know where you're going to be, mm -hmm. you know, in divinity school, in this course of study. And in our conversations in, over these last couple of days, you came up with the phrase, um, the act of creation, which I love because it's both creation, as you've been discussing in wildness, but also the act of creation, a new way of being, again, to go back to this or the practice of civil disobedience. Can you kind of give us a, a taste of, of what you're thinking about as, as you pursue these three years, knowing what you know now, and also what your hopes are? Um, that's tough because I don't, uh, I don't have a real clear vision of how that's gonna work out um, or um, what things are gonna look like at the other side of those three years. Um, I definitely feel drawn to um, to tapping into the spiritual questions that, that we're struggling with right now um, of how do we connect with our values. Um, I mean, the tipping point that pushed me into uh, deciding to go to divinity school was uh, the key turning point in my legal case where during the jury selection, the judge and prosecutor found out that most of the jurors had, had gotten a pamphlet from the Fully Informed Jurors Association uh, before they came in on the first day about jury rights and why we have juries and how juries are meant to be the conscience of the community. Um, and the prosecutor lost it at this. He totally flipped out and was panicked at the notion that these people had been told they could use their conscience. Um, and, uh, and he wanted a mistrial. He wanted to get rid of everybody. And rather than do that, the judge called each juror in one at a time to his chambers, um, and me and my legal team were in there, the prosecution was in there, and the judge would say to each potential juror, uh, now you understand that uh, you need to disregard everything on that pamphlet. Uh, you need to un understand that it's not your job to decide what's right or wrong. Your job is to, to listen to what I say the law says, and you have to enforce it, even if you think it's morally wrong. Can you do that? Can you do what I ask you to do, even if you think it's morally wrong? And unless they said yes, they weren't on the jury. 
Um, and, and I was sitting in the seat closest to the juror, and I watched one person after another say, yes, Your Honor, I'll do whatever you tell me to do, even if I think it's morally wrong. And, and I could tell that they meant it. Um, and, and that was a real moment of clarity for me because, um, you know, first off, I knew that's when I was going to get convicted, um, was watching that happen. Um, but it's also, it's also the first time that I really understood how some of the great atrocities in history can happen, mm. how, how things like a genocide could happen where you have a whole population carrying out the whims of, of one sociopathic tyrant. Um, you know, when, when people buy into that notion that it's not their job to decide what's right or wrong, and they just have to listen to an authority um, and let go of their own conscience. Um, and, and so I saw that when people abandon their own moral authority, then any atrocity was possible. But at the same time, I saw the prosecutor freaking out that he was the, the United States attorney. He represented the United States of America and had all of that power and authority behind him, and yet he felt vulnerable to the idea of citizens using their conscience when they're exercising their civic duties. And, and, and so I saw this huge di divergence hinging on the power of conscience, that when people abandon their own conscience, that, that any atrocity was possible. But when people had faith in their own moral authority and held onto their conscience, that there was no power and in institution which couldn't be affected by that. And, and I saw that hinging on conscience. And, and I realized that that was really a spiritual issue. Mm -hmm. and, and if the majority of our society, if 12 out of 12 people were willing to abandon their own moral authority that easily and let go of it, that that's really a spiritual failure for our society. And one that looking at the future that we're facing is very scary. You know, we, we know that when there are hardships and difficulties, um, that those in power resort to desperate acts to hold on to that authority. Um, we know that in times of trouble, um, authorities try to scapegoat certain classes of people to hold on to their power and to divide people. Um, we know that they ask their, their own people uh, to turn against one another. Um, and, and if we don't have that faith in our own moral authority, um, that's a dangerous road that lies ahead of us. And, and so I felt like uh, that was the thing that I had to address of uh, tapping into where that faith in our own moral authority and our shared moral authority as a community, um, where that comes from and how we can connect with that and, and hold on to that faith um, and strengthen that and, and draw it out of one another um, so that we're ready um, when we're in that situation where, you know, we're out of our element and, you know, in a big courthouse, you know, you know, with all the majesty of the courthouse and a, and a judge in all his robes and regalia sitting above us, speaking to us in a very patriarchal way, saying, um, you know, your job is to do what I tell you, even if you think it's morally wrong, um, that, that we're ready when we get to that point. You know, whatever it is that that authority is asking us to do down the road uh, to turn against one another, um, I think it's that faith in our moral authority that'll make us ready for that. Um, and, and that's what I call, that, uh, that's what I feel like I'm called to address. Um, and, uh, you know, over the next three years, I'm not sure um, what that will look like, um, but uh, I feel like this is the path that I need to be on, and, uh, and I don't know where it's gonna lead. Um, you know, I certainly didn't expect to be at this point five years ago. Um, you know, five years ago I was uh, an economics student um, concerned about climate change and thinking that I would be the guy in the movement um, that was always having wonky conversations about economics and, you know, always, always the guy talking about alternatives to the GDP. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I ended up in a very different place. And uh, uh, I want to remain open to that in the future. You know, I think, I think this is my next step. Beyond that, uh, I'm not sure. So uh, I'm trying to, to remain open to that. Um, I wanna, before we close. Yeah, and I uh, want to publicly say something to you. Before we close, um, uh, I want to point out that the, the four folks in, from Michigan that I've been talking about uh, that, that are taking their case to trial, 
um, are here tonight. Um, um, Will you stand? Will you stand? I think they had a flyer out there um, about uh, an event that they're having for their legal defense fund um, that had the wrong date on it. Um, it's actually October 25th, not September. Um, so keep that in mind, because uh, they do need our support. Yeah. I just personally want to thank each of you as well. And we will not leave you behind. And um, it's an honor to meet you and to be able to support you. And Tim, I want to personally and... Publicly. Um, you know, when you spoke to the judge in your closing arguments, you said, this is what love looks like. And um, I think that is a truth. And I want you to know I love you. I want you to know how much I appreciate your voice. And what I want the audience to know is that when the judge came down on Tim with his sentence, what he said was, it's not what you did that was so bad. It's the voice you had afterwards. And what he was saying was, you inspired us. You inspire us. You inspire me. The eyes of the future are looking back at us, and they are praying that we might see beyond our own time. Thank you for your eyes of the future. Thank you.